<laughs> so good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you to the Indiana University, uh, the Heritage um, Civil Rights Heritage. And um, we've been open about 10 years. Behind that Mac is, is George Garner. He's the assistant here. And George can take you on tours later on and tell you more information than I can. So um, my name is Charlotte Pfeiffer, and I'm a member of the 466 Works Community Development Corporation. And I also live in a neighborhood that has lots of vacant lots and abandoned buildings. So this topic means a lot to me, and I know it clearly means a lot to all of you. Just look around and see who's here, but also know that we have at least 33 people on Zoom, and probably more people will be joining us. So that's a wonderful thing. So uh, the name of this is Using Land Banks as a Tool to Transform Vacant and Abandoned Properties into Community Assets. Reuse of vacant lots and abandoned homes is critical. It's a challenge to our community, and it is, it, it is a barrier to development. Many of the lots are caught up in red tape and redlining and tax sales, and people buy lots and hold them, and they also keep abandoned buildings because they do, most people intend to do something with it. The problem is it doesn't happen. And so land banking is a tool that we think will be organized, it will be inclusive, and it's a democratic way so that we can do something of, of use for the whole community with these vacant lots and these abandoned buildings. This is a real chance for South Bend to do something good. And so we need to come together, get as much information as we can, ask all the questions, do good thinking, so that we can step up and do something good for our community. When you think about what's going on in the world, when you think about what's going on in our country, we're pretty fortunate here, aren't we? So I think we need to keep that in mind as we focus today on something that we can do to make our community wonderful. I want to thank our co-sponsors to let you know how interested people are. We have nine co-sponsors. I'm going to read them. Including 466 Works, the Community Forum for Economic Justice, the Far Northwest Neighborhood Association, Habitat for Humanity of St. Joseph County, Housing Works LLC, the Near Northwest Neighborhood, the Northeast Neighborhood Revitalization Organization, Prosperity Indiana, and South Bend Heritage Foundation. Let's give these organizations a hand. We all came together to support this because we care about our community. And this has long been an issue. I remember years ago, those of us who are around here, we know that when Kmart had that building, they had two buildings, one in Mission Walker and one here. And there's been different other properties that are kind of held hostage. Again, most people intend to do something good, but it just never happens. So I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, Tarek Abdelazim, is the director of National Technical Assistance for the Center for Community Progress who is one of the nation's leading experts on land banks. The Center for Community Progress is the leading national not-profit resource for urban, suburban, and rural communities seeking to address the full cycle of property revitalization. To date, Community Progress has provided technical assistance and support to hundreds of communities, and they reach tens of thousands of people across the United States through their educational offerings. After um, his talk, we're going to have Q&A, and I'm going to be passing out some cards in case some people like to write them down. And George is going to be looking at the Q&A from our Zoom customers, so we'll make sure we have it in an organized way for you. So let's give um, him a wonderful, warm South Bend welcome. I'm going to follow her lead. I'm also vaccinated. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I'm a walker and a talker, but I just realized if that camera, we have Zoom fellows, I can't be walking around, right? What's that? Oh. Sweet. 
I also drank too much coffee, so I need to walk around. Um, yeah, and I, and I want to say I felt a little odd. While I'm leading this project with Prosperity Indiana, I never go anywhere without the guidance of our organization's wise counsel, which is usually to keep me out of trouble. Um, so I should say welcome to Archivalism and Matt Kreis. So can we just give a quick warm welcome? <laughs> I'm going to jump right into it. We have a, a lot of slides to go through. I want this to be as educational informational as possible, but I also want you all to have a conversation right, with me, with each other. So I want to try to reserve as much space for uh, questions and answers. So real quick, to repeat again, Center for Community Progress, I think you've heard, national leader on helping communities deal with vacant, abandoned, deteriorated properties. One thing, we do this with a focus on racial equity and justice. And we'll start the conversation there once we get past this intro. We do it through technical assistance. We do it through education. We work on policy at all levels of government. Uh, we do it through research and we do it in collaborations with many national groups and local partners. Um, why are we here in South Bend? Uh, we launched uh, a new program called the Land Bank Incubator Scholarship Program. And it was a national competitive program where we would provide about 200 hours of technical service, totally free, thanks to support from uh, a foundation, Texas Arnold Ventures. And we uh, were delighted to have this incredible application from Prosperity Indiana, a statewide association, membership association, builds better future for communities. And I pulled it right from your website so I didn't get it wrong, <laughs> by providing advocacy, leveraging resources, and engaging an empowered network of members to create inclusive opportunities that build assets and improve lives. Uh, my partner, uh, Marie from Prosperity Indiana, is here as well. We also wanted to make sure that we thought this was a great opportunity when we work in states on land banks, we always try to build that capacity in state, right? That knowledge, that power. Um, so when we leave, that you can continue the good work. And we've uh, had a lot of success in states where we've worked with statewide partners. But it wasn't just Prosperity Indiana. It was a very diverse and inclusive team that they put together with their scholarship applications. There's representatives from cities all across the state, from rural region areas. We have state representatives. We have academics, practitioners. Um, so we were, we were really impressed with the application why they were one of the top winners in the country. So what are we here to do? Well, the primary objective through this program is to build the field of land banking across the country, right? We saw the field explode after the mortgage foreclosure crisis, Great Recession. We'll talk more about that. But clearly now we're in a position where our neighborhoods are facing again serious uh, destabilizing factors, homes, households, people, certain communities disproportionately impacted. And so as local leaders are thinking about, hopefully thinking about an equitable recovery, we want to make sure that they understand land banks could prove a very valuable tool in that work. So we have been in Indiana before, uh, technical assistance engagements uh, it's back in 2014, working with the city of Gary, Lake County, uh, city of Indianapolis, Evansville, and some more. So first I wanna start with establishing some common ground. I wanna explain a little bit about our approach at Center for Community Progress, right? It's three things I wanna focus on. One, centering racial equity. Two, that our approach is a data-driven approach. And three, it's a systems-based approach. Okay, so one, we know that if we have looked back at a history of fighting blight, right, that has been quite traumatic. There have been lived experience, particularly people of color, that uh, this is not uh, an area of trust for government to partake in. Uh, and this goes way back, right? There's race-based restrictive zoning ordinances at the start of 1900s, trying to institutionalize segregation. We know about redlining. There's been a lot more conversation, both locally, nationally, about this horrible practice, right? Denying mortgages to residents of hazardous neighborhoods, defined simply by the presence of black folks, immigrants, et cetera, non-white uh, individuals that denied them and locked them out of access to private financing. But there is another more pernicious activity, again, by the federal government, in which they basically said, we will not insure loans of large subdivisions unless you include race-based restrictive covenants. So many subdivisions were built that said, you can only sell this home to a Caucasian member, right? So really locked 
a lot of black folks out of opportunities of wealth building, and this has had generational impacts. And then urban renewal. I know there's in South Bend the whole. I read a little bit about that. Does anyone remember experiences, urban renewal? Families, right? We know, we look at those projects, we know the rhetoric behind that and some of the intention. Uh, it was less than noble and it literally decimated a lot of black neighborhoods, vibrant black neighborhoods, commercial corridors, and created physical instruments of segregation. So when we talk about vacancy and abandonment, I'm not here to just say, what are the property like in the neighborhood right now? Right? This is about unwinding harm, un unwinding decades of harm. Um, this is, uh, maybe you all have seen this, South Bend's uh, Hulk map. So just, again, keeping that center uh, in our attention. Our second key approach that I want to mention is a data-driven approach, right? There's some communities that hear land bank and they're like, yeah, we want a land bank. Well, what is the problem? What are you trying to solve? Right, so we have to we we work with communities on their data systems, making sure that they understand really what is the inventory scope, scale, and nature of the problem you're trying to solve. Right, are you keeping track of where your tax liens, tax certificates, code violations, utility shutoffs, um, occupancy status, structure conditions? But that's only one subset. Right, the second one is looking at the neighborhood housing market conditions, because we know that even in some cities. Right, we have strong neighborhoods and then we have very weak neighborhoods. A few blocks can be the difference of living 15 more years longer, right? Research has shown. So really trying to understand what the housing market conditions are because the strategies we use from code enforcement to tax enforcement to land bank and community development, they're gonna change based on the housing market conditions. A typical approach to code enforcement may work very well in an affluent neighborhood. It could be very harmful to residents in a poor neighborhood. Social data, and this is the most important, this should be at the center of all of our work, right? The comprehensive approach and strategies, we need to engage those who are most impacted by vacancy and, and abandonment. They should be at the design of the solutions and they should be part of implementation. Now, if we look at some of those data sets, markets and demographics, right? We know that this is a challenge here in South Bend. What we see all over the country in regards to legacy cities, Northeast, the Midwest, and so not all over the country, Great Lakes, Midwest, Northeast, but in many communities elsewhere, that there is a massive outmigration. There's a hollowing out of the core, right? And so from 1960 to 2010, city lost about a quarter of its population. Anybody think that's going to cause an impact, imbalance with supply and demand, right? So demolition is going to be a, a part, a strategy of dealing with it, but it shouldn't be your only strategy. This is always an interesting uh, resource that is a racial dot map. It is from 2010, but it is every single individual mapped by race. And it just is an amazing tool to visualize how so many of our communities are still segregated. So if we look at some of the parcel data, and we weren't here to do an analysis of the data, right? We're here to do education, but our friends have been doing great work here, provided some of this and borrowed it from a report by Ann and Carl in the back, are all of the map of the vacant lots in South Bend held by St. Joseph's County, right? Because there's a tax certificate. It's a lot of lots, right? You wonder why nothing's being done, or you wonder why there's so much garbage, or people aren't mowing, right? The system's broken. So uh, finally, systems-based approach. So I told you we'd get through this because I talk fast, but then I just dries my mouth out. So just hold on a second. This, I think, is most important. Let me just ask this question. Does anybody feel that the status quo is building equitable, inclusive neighborhoods here in South Bend? Right, no. And it's not really anywhere. Just, just so you know, it's not local leadership. It's, it's, this is systemic. And so we really like to focus on the underlying systems that are causing some of these problems. Um, and if you think about a property owner, they have two kind of primary responsibilities when it comes to you know, the, the social good, the common good, being a good neighbor, keep your property up with repairs and keep up with property taxes, right? And if somebody slips with that, it's these two systems, these two enforcement systems, they're usually used to bring the property owner into compliance, right? So we work on those two systems. 
We work on data systems, code enforcement, tax enforcement, and then land banking on the back end, and I think you'll see why. But when we work with communities, we want to make sure that they are first equitable. People can experience financial hardship and fall behind on their repairs or their taxes because they have a health emergency. Um, we have a pandemic, right? I mean, there are disasters that uh, households, that neighborhoods, that communities face that we want to make sure that there are, as my good friend calls them, off-ramps, equitable off-ramps, right? We don't want to be punitive. We don't want to criminalize poverty, right? So these two systems, one, design with equity in mind. But then if we have those owners, right, those with means, those LLCs, those out-of-town investors, those speculators, where we know that they have the resources and they're being negligent and they're externalizing harms onto neighbors and neighborhoods, right? Now we want to make sure these are efficient and effective. And if we can't get compliance, then we want to fire the owner. We'll give you a chance. We'll fix it. You got to pay. But if you're not going to pay, we're firing you and we're going to find a responsible owner. So here are those two different mechanisms. Usually code lane enforcement received. These are technical terms. I'm not going to get into it too much. Here in Indiana, I did this for my friend Jim Kelly, so he did <laughs> unsafe building law as one of those tools, tax lien enforcement. But what happens is in most communities, these tax systems are also broken and they're inequitable and they're antiquated. I served City Hall in New York for eight years before I came to Community Progress seven and a half years ago. I thought all the tax systems were as good as in New York. Oh boy, was I wrong. They are horrible, terrible, inequitable. And thanks to Matt and my other colleagues at Community Progress, we spend a lot of time trying to optimize in these with great partners in the community. What happens generally, let's say we bring, we enforce those delinquent taxes. Now the property comes under temporary ownership of the government, right? The foreclosed, the tax governmental unit. Here in Indiana, we know in St. Joseph's County, they first offer the tax certificate to an investor, to anybody. They have to sit on it for a year, it takes a long process, or no one bids on it, they can withdraw it, and then you have just these lots all over the place, or they could bring it in house and then they could do some things with it, maybe sell it for cheaper. But there's a better approach because in most places we go to, and particularly in weak housing markets, Right? When those properties come through the tax foreclosure, you're attracting the same purchasers at that auction that are causing harms in that neighborhood or in other neighborhoods or in, a, or in other communities in the county. Right? They have mastered this. Or they just go for those that they know that the person will pay back and they collect 12%. It's easy profit. Right? Instead of that staying with the government and, and providing services. So we say, forget that. Think about a land bank as an alternative to the speculative auction, right? That ensures the transfer of tax foreclosed properties to responsible buyers that are well vetted by the land bank with community ownership and buy-in in order to generate predictable outcomes, right? As was mentioned, some of those folks buy those properties with the intention to do good, or they're just investing and speculating, or they're landlords and slumlords and they're milking the equity of our already substandard rental property, right, and harming the tenants. This is a way to gain control. And what this really means is that communities that have moved to Lamech are starting to challenge and rethink their approach to land. That land is like an infrastructure asset. Right? that we recognize that this is the most valuable commodity in our community, and we have to take a little more stewardship and guide that towards the outcomes that we want. Right? More equitable, more inclusive, more resilient as, as we're facing Hurricane Ida's and storms and fires. But I like to bring this up, right? These are local crises that we see in every community. We still see the impact of redlining, disparities, in home ownership, in uh, uh, segregated communities still, right? The market's not gonna fix that. Market by itself is not gonna fix that. We see an incredible and systemic poverty. It's also racialized, that wealth gap, right? I mean, white households 14 to one, their wealth compared to black households. 
For the first time in the presidential race, we saw housing rising up as, a, as an important right, issue. And this is in every community, I'm telling you. Because if I'm not in the communities that are struggling with vacancy and abandonment, we're in Miami and Portland, and nobody who is making less than 50,000 can find affordable housing. So there's a housing crisis in every community in this country, and rural areas are hit just as hard. And then flooding. So again, one of the things that connects all four of these crises is land. Who owns it? Who controls it? Who determines its use? Land is power, land is wealth, right? Land is a pathway towards more equitable, inclusive communities. So a land bank is truly a way, not the only way, but is a tool to move in that direction. All right, so what exactly is it? What am I talking about here? A land bank is a public authority, nonprofit, you can call it a quasi-governmental entity, and it has a laser focus on the conversion of vacant, abandoned, and tax delinquent properties towards productive use and in support of equitable community development outcomes. There are about 250 land banks nationwide. As you can see, over 80% of them established since 2008, right? While they might go back to the 70s, the first few, and then there was a big change in 2000 in Michigan, in 2009, after mortgage foreclosure crisis, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, more states started to pass legislations to deal with this glut of abandoned inventory that was coming down through the foreclosure crisis. Almost all of them are created pursuant to state legislation, and that's really important, and we'll talk about why. Michigan, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, and the Peach State have the largest number of land banks uh, in the country. And this is key, right? They don't go out and just buy property. They're not competing on the open market. They are basically, if you think about it, right, the public broker, a broker on behalf of the public to take land, tax foreclosed properties, distressed properties, properties with legal and financial barriers, and then turn them into productive use consistent with community priorities. Over 90% of the properties held by land banks across the whole country came through this tax foreclosure process, right? And I say that because it's just, it's really important to emphasize that is the primary pipeline of properties. So you go back to the St. Joseph's County map with all those vacant lots, that's just the tax certificates they hold. We don't know how many that they've offered up for auction and then withdrawn. In Gary, there were thousands. They didn't show up under ownership. So like, this is why like helping communities also understand what the problem is, is a key part of the work we do. So what are some of these key powers? Well, as I mentioned, they're authorized through state enabling legislation. They have ability to acquire tax foreclosures cost effectively. And by that, in some states, they have what's called a priority bid. So if a county creates a land bank, they don't even have to offer them up for auction. They could just go directly to the land bank. The land bank jumps ahead of all the investors. In Georgia, they actually had a credit bid provision, and in Tennessee, whereas they don't have to pay anything because the land bank is doing a community service. It's taking a distressed property that nobody wants, that's creating negative harms in the community, that's draining fire, police, code calls, and it's going to bring in grants and investment and turn that into an asset, right? So it's like you don't even have to pay for it. Most land bank legislation, land banks can hold property tax exempt. There are few ways that they could generate revenue. Obviously, this is a very uh, cash intensive initiative, right? Because if these properties had values, the market would be picking them up. So there are some, but this remains a, a big challenge for land banks all across the country. But good news on the horizon, we'll get there. And here's the most important thing, is that the reason why this is usually better than the government is because government is bound by restrictive disposition procedures, right? Highest bid, competitive, RFP. The land bank can say, you know, we set our policies. Our policies are permanent affordable housing. Our policies are first-time home buyers, right? And then they can sell based on those outcomes, not by the highest price, but who's getting the best use of the property consistent with community outcomes, right? What the community is deemed a priority. 
So uh, I'm going to go through this just real quick. I'll mention this. They will always need some level of support. You can't wave a wand and say land banks are self-sustaining. We'll just create it. Go. Always need some level of support, cash or in kind, proportional to the scale of the problem that it's expected to help resolve. The two things I want to mention here, emphasis on community engagement. We do uh, have template land bank legislation that has probably been the basis of every state enabling legislation of the last 10 years. And we make sure that there are provisions in here to make sure that there are transparent, accountable decisions. We never give a land bank eminent domain. You cannot build trust in a community that has been harmed historically if you also have those powers. So we're very mindful about that. One other way in which land banks can be most effective is partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Right? If you think about land as an asset and these vacant lots and vacant structures as an open canvas, there are so many different reuses that can meet community goals. Is there food insecurity, right? Food injustice, the lack of permanent affordable housing, just decent, safe housing, uh, allowing some to build equity and selling their lots. Some of these communities, the lots are so small over the years, 30 square feet or 30 feet in front, you know, add on a side lot. And then we've seen some land banks actually now working on green stormwater infrastructure. So, you know, it really is the land bank can't do this. You need an ecosystem of partners in the community that can help accomplish these outcomes. So now the fun part. Let's just look at what's happening with land banks all across the country. I guess before I do that, does anyone have questions? I will also bring up some key points through this, but I just want to pause. Does anyone have questions yet? Any of the technical aspect? Yes, sir. Yeah. Before what? Before yeah. Of course. It all depends based on different state laws and what the minimum bid is. Now in Indiana, I do believe it is all of the liens at the uh, Jim or Matt, you can correct me, but at the first tax certificate sale, all of the public liens have to be loaded and that's the minimum bid. If no one bids on it, that's when they can go to the county and they can re-offer it lower than the minimum bid. So sometimes you'll see speculators like, I'm not going to bid now because I'll get it even cheaper. So, but there have been some complaints like land banks are, you know, usurping our rights you had every chance to go buy it before it went to foreclosure, right? You just want the cheapest possible way to generate as much profit as possible. Um, so been able to fight back some of those legal challenges in other states, um, but that's just the usual rhetoric. Who are the stakeholders in the land bank? It's a great question. There's some legislation that prescribes basically who, can, who should be on it, Oftentimes, it's a mix of government officials, right? If there are needs of coordination with the data, some funding, or the tax foreclosure at the county, those are smart, actually, people have on, but not all of them. Uh, you should have a mix, then, of the community representatives and specifically those from the neighborhoods that are most impacted by vacant abandonment. Um, there's oftentimes where there are no government officials. There are some land bank boards that have none of them. And the professionals in the community, again, mixed with community members. In Indiana, your state legislation is very prescriptive. It like says exactly who can be on the board. Uh, it's a challenge that we see, and we're trying to think of ways that we might be able to bring some reforms to the state to ensure that there's greater community representation. A great question. Yes. Just to add on to that, there are other land banks um, that have created, uh, so not just in the that's the management side of things, but that also create separate advisory boards or other things like that, particularly in those neighborhoods where they're going to be working the most, so they can get the input on exactly how to set their priorities and how to uh, make sure that that inventory goes as quickly as that. That's usually what they do. 
in those other areas. Now, that's not necessarily a controlling state in the direction of the landing. So there's a, you know, less control there. You've got to acknowledge that. But they yeah. can be useful also to make sure that more voices are brought. Our preference is always community members where power sits, yeah. right? Where, where there, you could actually exercise power. Um, we'll get into some examples. I think we'll also be able to touch on some of that. Yes. Sorry. Yes, I will. Yes. That's a great question. Um, if I may, can I hold till we get to some of the examples? Because there's some land banks that have specifically taken a challenge on. Um, sir, you had a question as well. Yeah, so I'm just curious, like you mentioned um, racial equity. How are you, like what's your definition of racial equity? And you talked about providing 200 hours of technical assistance to the community. And so um, given that there are generational divides in terms of like wealth training, uh, I love it. One, we're going to rely. Uh, the question was, what was the definition of racial equity? How are you kind of operationalizing, implementing it in the field of land banking? And through this scholarship program, if, we're, if I'm up here touting that, how are we actually uh, bringing racial equity and engaging young black folks in this process? So I'll start with the second one. We designed the scholarship program and our approach to that was we carved out, we took some of the hours from us away, we were fine with that, we'll give a pro bono, carved out $20,000 grant, it's called an inclusivity grant. So each one of the scholarship winners. So we have it and we're still not sure how to engage, how to use that, but it's a resource as part of the scholarship. And part of this goal when we go out and talk with folks is to get some ideas, like how do we keep you engaged in this process? We were thinking about, building a, a team of folks and then even bringing folks to the state legislature if we have some proposed reforms or are there other ways but will you be part of that conversation ongoing or offer your ideas <laughs> all right thank you because this, this is really why one of the reasons why we're out here as well uh, in regards to i mean equity is that you know you cannot there is no determinant of outcomes based on race right race is not your determinant of outcomes it cannot be an indicator of outcomes. So specifically about racial equity, we, we wanted to focus just on racial equity, and we speak about this because we're in a space in housing, land use, zoning, right? Where the homes is the American dream is the one avenue to build wealth. And we see how so many uh, disparate and disproportionate impacts uh, to folks, and with pandemic, it's been exacerbated. Same communities of color, poor communities, that have been impacted historically are now again impacted uh, disproportionately again. So that's why we focus on racial equity when we do this work. And it is tough to have those conversations sometimes, right? We're in some spaces where I can see half the room wants to walk out, but as we made the decision, that's where we lead and that's where we're gonna stick with it. I hope that helps. So, but let's we'll also talk about some examples where we've challenged the field. And we're still exploring too. You know, nobody has the answer to this yet. Uh, first, let's just look here in Indiana. Evansville, one of the three land banks that have been created here in uh, Indiana. Evansville, Muncie, I think one in Newcastle, but we're not exactly sure of the structure. I wanted to just point out this. There's really strong political leadership and buy-in for our land bank in Evansville. They are united around a common goal they follow it with follow up that commitment with money. They've committed $1 million annually from their general fund. I know not all counties or cities can do that. And about, they have a good relationship with the county. Right? So the county sends those to tax certificate sale, that first one, if nobody buys them and about 50% of those properties, nobody buys or bids, then the land bank has an agreement with the county that it could buy any of those. And so I want to say is, Barring any changes to the state legislation, right? And there, there are some ways to optimize it. There's still good work happening with some of the three key elements we see for successful land banks all across this country. Political leadership, commitment of resources, right? And partnerships 
across governments and with the community. So they work with uh, affordable housing developers. They've done incredible work with Habitat for Humanity, with other affordable housing developers that have worked to assemble lots and bring in large uh, low-income housing tax credit grants. They've even partnered with the fire and de uh, police departments for training exercises. So let's now scan the national field. So Cuyahoga County Land Bank in Ohio, an absolute leader in the field. And one of the reasons why is because they've solved their funding problem in Ohio, the only state that has. And we'll talk about that later. They have an incredible whole spectrum of innovative housing programs. They realized we have a massive pipeline of homes. Well, let's go talk with the human service agencies that are working with folks that have a pipeline of, of people that need secure housing, right? I'm a believer of the housing first approach, get people in safe, secure housing, and let's work on some other, any other social economic issues. They first did this with the Refugee Services Collaboration. It's the, the group that handles refugees in Cleveland. They allowed them to look at their entire inventory. They picked lots usually on transit lines. They split the cost to rehab it, then they sold it for a dollar to the center. Uh, it has been a huge boon. It worked so well that they said, well, let's just keep doing this. So women in crisis, folks coming back from jail, uh, justice involved folks, veterans, right? They've really done an incredible job recognizing community priorities, right? Forget the speculators, the out of town, and, right? Slumlords, we have needs in our community. Let's use this as a tool to address it in an equitable manner. In Syracuse Land Bank, they have probably one of the largest inventories in New York, about a thousand properties. Um, they have a public employee discount program, but there's just one that's interesting. And this is something that I think like, you know, trying to encourage municipalities to do. Yes, funding is a challenge, but you could still assemble land because you're assembling opportunity, right, for down the road. And so they, they spend five years acquiring these parcels in this, uh, historically disinvested neighborhood. Uh, they were able to work with an anchor institution, the St. Joseph's Hospital, that also located community uh, health center there. And they were able to get 16 distressed parcels, 53 new units serving very low and extremely low uh, uh, income families. $16 million project. Or you could just stick with the status quo, right? I mean, these are, this is the long game. Right, land is an asset. It's the long game. If we're unwinding historic harm and imperative function, this is the long game. The Blight Authority of Memphis, thousands of properties and challenges in Memphis. Um, and so this is interesting. You know how I showed like the, the hollowing out of the core in those legacy cities? Same thing's happening in these cities. Though they show population growth, it's because they're annexing and they just keep growing wider and wider, but yet you go back to the historic core of the city and you see the same disinvested neighborhoods with challenges that you see in the Buffaloes, the Clevelands, the Baltimores, et cetera. But in, in Tennessee, nonprofit housing develop, or how, affordable housing developers are not nonprofits. They don't get tax exempt status. So it's really hard for them to pull in property from the tax foreclosure sale, hold it, and then try to go get the financing. So the Blight Authority of Memphis, which is their land bank, created pursuant to state enabling legislation, does have tax, tax exempt status, and they have a program called the Land Deposit Program. They just launched it this last year. They already have about 100 parcels in their portfolio. Literally, non, uh, affordable housing developers grab their parcels, deposit them into BAM, literally as a land bank in this case, and then it gives them about three years, they charge them a fee, they deal with the maintenance, and then when they get their finances, they could withdraw the land, right? And ready to go with the project, saving them tens of thousands of dollars over that time. In Macon Bibb County Land Bank in Georgia, uh, I think the important thing here is that, you know, we do have EDS, MEDS, or your anchor institutions. They have to play a role in housing and neighborhood stabilization. More and more hospitals are particularly now after pandemic, realizing housing is health, right? That, that they need to focus on the housing needs. Mercer University, the medical center, uh, this is like a 10 year initiative, um, but they stuck to this place-based investment. You know, this 
four, eight block neighborhood here in Beals Hill. Historically, one of the historic African-American neighborhoods and they have completely transformed it. But the point there is like, look at all those partners and the many years that they stayed focused on that, right? Patience, persistence, partnerships, focused around a common vision defined by the community. Lucas County Land Bank in Ohio, they did something amazing in 2015. They did a parcel survey of every 122,000 parcels in Toledo, Ohio. They sent a team around, they got a grant from a foundation, they also contributed some funds, hired residents from some of those neighborhoods that experienced vacancy and abandonment, and they found the parcel condition occupancy status, some of it's guessing subjective, is it A or F, right, in regards to grade. They then figured that out and they were like, holy cow, we have like 2,000 properties that are F that have to be demolished, and the C's need repair grants or they're gonna be F's right, in three, five years, and the taxpayer will have to pay for it. They're like, but we have no resources. And then the federal government came forward with the hardest hit funds. Ohio, and I'll explain it later, but it was, they never expected the money, but they did the work that they needed, that they could do at the time. They have demolished every single one of those properties. It's just, it's, it's just incredible what they've done. They've also done a lot of obviously repair. They've done a lot of uh, new home ownership opportunities, but it just goes to show is the better you understand your neighborhood conditions and you involve the residents in that kind of surveying and planning, um, you can really achieve some incredible work. What's excellent is that they're now doing it again, right? Now, now they can literally measure the impact that they've had across the entire city of Toledo. Uh, Broome County Land Bank, New York, disclosure, that's where I'm from. Uh, I serve on the board. <laughs> we did, uh, there were some private landlords, and we're seeing this more and more with the pandemic, that some of those that have been trouble slumlords, they're bundling their portfolio, and they're now selling it in massive portfolios. And investors and institutional investors are picking them up. Some folks in the real estate market is like, they've never seen anything like this. What we did is uh, we learned that one, uh, landlord that was not a very responsible landlord was retiring his portfolio we brought in an affordable housing developer partnered together he went out and got the low-income housing tax credit we assembled some tax foreclosed properties in this area and completely transformed this block and again uh, extremely low to very low income families now being served where the deficit is the greatest in our community in Huntington Land Bank, this is in West Virginia, right? So, I mean, like, these are not just urban areas. These are rural areas. These are coal mining towns. These are regional rural areas. Um, what they did was they realized, yeah, we can pull 100 properties, but maintaining them is costly, right? And we don't want to be the next slumlord in the city, right? So we have to make sure that we're a good steward uh, what they did was they worked with an organization that was working with justice involved individuals. They brought in a grant to fund, to pay them to do the maintenance. So it was free maintenance on the land bank. About, I think a third of these uh, participants ended up finding jobs in the landscaping uh, industry after their year work on this. So it's just, again, one of those where it's like, you could be as creative as you want, really. It's the imagination is your limit. Uh, innovative partnerships in Houston Land Bank. They have a great partnership with the city where they hold about 500 properties that the city owned. The city builds homes on them. The city does that. And then it's up to the land bank to market them. And they could do one of two things. As you say, you can buy it on the open market, 220, or we have a partnership with a community land trust. You can buy it for 120 and you put it in the community land trust so it's permanently affordable housing and it will serve generations of families. So it's really interesting. They give that opportunity, right? You wanna buy market rate or do you wanna expand permanent affordable housing at a significantly discounted price? But they're just doing great work down there and you can see some of these impacts are incredibly impressive. I'm gonna finish on Albany County Land Bank. Uh, and how I think as we've challenged the land banks in the field the last couple of years to really think about what does it mean to implement racial equity, to think of all of your policies and operations through that lens, I think that they've 
probably done the best in, in, in achieving that, or at least advancing that. I think it's interesting, this is their inventory. In Albany County, the county stopped doing tax for, uh, auctions altogether. They just said, this is a negative. This generates negative outcomes. They created the land bank. Every property that is not redeemed, that is foreclosed, goes directly to the land bank for $1. So they have also, similar to Syracuse, they have the second largest inventory in New York. But look at this, this is their inventory overlaid over the redlining map. It's like, it just, it's mind blowing to show, you know, 80 years later, the impact of some of these policies, right? It's no coincidence. So one of the things they did was they partnered, we worked with them to think through like what would a land bank community land trust partnership be? Community land trust is a, a how, affordable housing, it's a nonprofit, but it focuses almost exclusively on permanent affordable housing. It also originated in the civil rights movement, right? Uh, uh, farmers down in Georgia, where they realized that power and control meant they had to get control of land, right? That was true liberty. And so they actually created the first community land trust. And they've since grown considerably to 240 across the country. They've kind of become under criticism because all they just did was start to become like another affordable housing developer. But now a lot of groups are reimagining, or I guess returning to the roots, so to speak. And that this is about community power and ownership and control and justice. But they, we worked with them is one of the first land banks to form a formal partnership with the land trust. And what would it mean if they played a role in offering home ownership opportunities to low-income families, not just in the poorest neighborhoods, where most of their inventory was, but when they got that occasional property that came through the tax foreclosure that was in the neighborhoods of opportunity, that was usually where they made their money so they could fund some of the demolitions. But they said, let's give it up. Because equity, as an outcome, has value, right? You need to invest in that. And so they gave up the opportunity and they created this program. It was called the Inclusive Neighborhood Programs where they changed their disposition policy so that any uh, property that comes through their inventory that is in neighborhoods of opportunity, the stronger neighborhoods, they would give the community land trust, first look, 45 days exclusive. Um, you can buy this at a significantly discounted price. Um, there have been about half a dozen properties that have gone through that, uh, and it has been, right, it's not going to create an inclusive community overnight, but the land bank is showing it can be a part of that. They also, as they were challenging themselves, they realized, you know, a report came out too that showed Albany had the highest uh, gap second highest gap nationally in home ownership rates by, by race. Significant, right? And if you see their inventory is in those five neighborhoods that are predominantly people of color, they're like, we have to do better. So they thought they were doing good, right? And they realized, you know what? Some of their programs, like they saw it as, yeah, we're giving folks first right, but there's still barriers, right? So they brought everyone, the folks that had failed applicants, people of color, and they were like, what were the reasons that made this a problem? And then they designed a program where they tried to design away the barriers, right? Folks said, I thought I knew what I was getting into, but it was just too much. Okay, uh, I didn't have, I didn't get the right scope of work done. So the Albany County Land Bank, one, there's preferences in their disposition to anyone who lives a legacy resident, who lives in that uh, neighborhood, or who had connections there historically. They would be offered the property first be a significant discounted sales price. They brought in assistance from a, a, another nonprofit for the closing cost. The land bank actually paid for a professional rehab scope of work. And then they assigned them a, a mentor throughout the entire process, right? All three, the first three that went through this process, 100% success. Uh, it, it just, some of the stories were just, just great. I think the last thing they've done too is they've, they've created uh, clusters, but they didn't just do an RFQ for a developer, they worked with the community to design the RFQ. So there are specific provisions in there about equity, equity about community control, 
about meeting with the community, getting their, pro like is incredibly impressive how they put that together with strong support from the community after they allowed them to be part of that uh, design. So the biggest problem across the country is funding, right? I mean, how are we dealing with this inventory of distressed properties in weak housing markets? Um, the best example is in Ohio. They're the only state that included in their state enabling legislation a provision of reliable, recurring, and significant funding. It allowed every county in, in Ohio uh, foreclosures, tax foreclosure enforcement only happens at the county level. So only counties could create land banks in Ohio. And they said that you can cut, pull out 5% of the delinquent fees, tax fees and interest, put it into a dedicated land bank fund, and then it goes to the land bank. So about two thirds of all the land banks in Ohio have committed the full 5%. For Cuyahoga County, that one with all the innovative housing programs, that's $7 million a year. That's an incredible amount of money. Uh, is there any step on all the ones with properties, not just the ones that are going, that are sold or, or acquired by, so, so the ones that are not acquired by the land bank, those delinquent fees are going into the land bank? Yeah, so as soon as someone doesn't pay in that either three months, six months, it starts accruing delinquent fees and interest and they could pay six months later or even a year later, but all of that fee and interest 5% goes directly to the land bank. Uh, in Toledo and, and Lucas County, it was about a couple, two or three million a year, but that's why they can be innovative, right? They're not chasing the next grant. Um, it's a national model. We've seen federal programs come through. This was the hardest hit funds. This was after the great uh, recession. ARPA, or excuse me, uh, ARA dollars, right? American Recovery Act. Uh, and they actually changed some of the provisions in this, uh, after a few years of this program. Uh, our co-founder who became a House representative? Yes, Dan Kildee, uh, Congressman. He helped fight this, because uh, he's from Flint, uh, Michigan, so he's very familiar with this. And he actually allowed demolition to be an eligible activity of these dollars, and there were about five different states that build these programs. Ohio was one of them. That's why Toledo was able to take down 2,000 properties and such. Is the largest like investment in demolition that nobody really knew about outside of those communities. Um, again, we're not huge fans of demolition. We recognize it has to be a part of the strategy, but that's why we also work on the code enforcement side, preventative work and let's try to keep and preserve a lot of these uh, structures. And then some governments are just borrowing. You know, they're like, this housing is so important, it's a crisis, they see it as an infrastructure asset, so they're using municipal bonding authority to do that. Here's some good news. At the federal level, um, we've been working on this, uh, also with a lot of other partners, national partners, but where there's National Land Bank Network legislation with some funding that's uh, pending. These two are very real. This proposed Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, as well as the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act. I will try not to get too geeky, but one of the biggest problems with trying to repair the homes in these weak housing markets is you need 100,000, 150,000 to fix them, but they'll only sell for 60, right? So nobody does it, or it's just it's a huge subsidy. This is going to solve that. It's gonna be a total game changer. We have tax, tax credit programs for low income housing tax credit, which is rental. We have tax credit program for kind of large economic development projects called new market tax credits. This is specifically for one to four unit family homes, and it will cover that gap. So like land banks could be at an incredible position to take advantage of this when this, and this is in the bills that are currently being considered right now, whether the infrastructure or the reconciliation bill. Same thing with this one, Restoring Communities Left Behind Act by key sponsors, Captor in Ohio and Tlaib in Michigan. Uh, and this is great because it really puts the power, I think, in the community. It's not just governments that can apply, it's land banks in partnership with a community land trust or a community land trust and partner with a resident group. Yeah. They're out of committee. They're in the bills that are, are being discussed right now. There's the infrastructure bill, and then there's the 
social human infrastructure built that they're going to do through reconciliation, and both of these are. Yeah, I th they're playing that game of chicken, right? You know, but yeah, it's and we're very positive that these two are going to get funded. Um, Marsha Fudge, the new HUD uh, uh, commissioner, she's very uh, HUD secretary. She's very supportive of this, and she's also proposing significant in significant increases in some HUD programs. Hopefully, that will work out as well. Now, here's where I just have to say: sorry if I'm giving away anything for the states or the county or local folks here, right? Every state just and. All 19,000 jurisdictions just got unprecedented recovery awards through Biden's 1.9 uh, trillion bill, right? Are folks familiar with that? Okay, right. South Bend, how much are you talking about? Yeah, 63 million. Joseph County, 52.7 million. Indiana, the state received 3.26 billion. Uh, so there is money that should be coming to neighborhoods to help stabilize homes, households, businesses, particularly those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And if you look at the US Treasury rule, they've gone, they, go, they went as far as they could without mandating, basically, you center racial justice. And I commend them for the language they put in there because they said that you should focus on not just those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, but those that were, who were historically harmed and the pandemic exacerbated those disparities. Uh, I don't think we're going to see great leadership everywhere. <laughs> so that is why we are also working with many land banks to help them advocate for their needs and to talk to their local representatives, their county governments, as well as their state officials. In Georgia, they've, the Georgia land banks have submitted a proposal of 25 or 30 million to the governor. Governor of Ohio, Republican, committed 500 million to neighborhood stabilization with land banks being a key recipient to help implement those. So like there are already examples. Um, so I would just say, yes, it may not be the most favorable wherever you are, but here in Indiana, is that it doesn't mean it's impossible, right? Um, so as our good friend and, and a land bank in, in Pennsylvania says, build your posse. <laughs> and go strong. So I would, I would say continue to do that. So these are a bunch of resources at our website. Uh, I also want to just stop now and offer uh, time for any questions. I hope you found that informative. I'm gonna. This is where I nod to the council. Yeah. <laughs> I think it'll be wording, right? Because, because, because <laughs> I mean, sounds like it would be harmful. It's okay. Not the I'm gonna repeat the question: Is that if there were changes to optimize a pretty good state enabling legislation, with a focus on optimizing community engagement and changing the board structure, would the existing land banks? have to then change their board or would they be grandfathered in as non-inclusive? Right, okay. Well, that is an excellent <laughs> and complicated question that totally depends on the land bank legislation to, to get passed. Um, and I'm looking in the back there because we've got a, a great partner here who's actually an expert in, in a lot of these things too. But, um, but I would say just, and if you feel, if you see I miss anything, Jim, please, please feel free to uh, add to this. But I would say it really depends on the legislation. Most legislation that would be passed would include, if that were to change, would probably or may include some kind of a savings clause that would preserve the structure of previous boards. Um, or if the choice was and there was a political will was behind it, it could change all. Um, but it would absolutely depend on the bill itself and, and sort of what their political will of the legislators was to change those certain things. Does that answer? Yeah, it does. And I think the reason why I'm asking this is if there's a lot of money right now building land banks 
seems like an unambiguous good, but we have a very prescriptive structure that's maybe not very community involved. Yeah. If it doesn't retrospectively, or if they're grandfathered in, is it really a good thing to build them on now? Well, I would I would say two things to that. One, no community should move forward with the land bank unless the community is moving forward with the land bank, right? Um, and if somebody is doing that with officials, then it might be difficult to even get a seat at the table, right? But I would say like, it should start with the community and that's why we're here uh, with nine sponsors, which is awesome. The second thing is, is there are other land banks that have found ways to engage the community that might've had the same kind of prescriptive board structure. And some have dedicated staff positions to director of community engagement. Right? Uh, to really show that they're committed to making this an inclusive process. There are others that have Matt said created advisory boards, but I, my point would be is like, no government jurisdiction should be moving forward with the land bank unless they're moving forward with the community. So this is, so we have to fill kind of every other this kind of goes to what you just said. Since the county owns the tax sale process, does the county or city take the lead it's a great question. So do I repeat that question or was that, okay. So the question was, since the county is the governmental unit that enforces and forecloses the property taxes, is, has oversight over that system, then should the county move forward or can the city? Like Evansville, right? Uh, we saw a municipal land bank move forward because they had a good partnership and relationship with the county. So where you have a good relationship, and we see this all over the country. And sometimes there's that, you know, blue urban core, red county, right? That's real. But there are still great conversations because what we have seen is that if you really get to it, you open up and like listen to people's lived experience in the rural areas, vacant property is a purple issue, right? There are just as many Republicans supporting these efforts than there are Democrats. Uh, so I like to think that it's, it's nonpartisan. This whole, I think both parties are guilty of not centering racial equity. I'll say that. Probably going to get in trouble from my council of saying that. But, um, but I do. I think they are. Uh, so I would say it depends on the relationship between those two. There was a reform to the state legislation last year that now allows for regional land banks or multi-jurisdictional. And we see that in the country, not as frequently, it's a little more challenging, but that could be a solution too here in Indiana. A great question. Yes, sir. And then I wanna make sure if others who hadn't asked have a chance, but please go ahead. Yep. Absolutely. Yes. So very, sh yeah, very shortened version of that is, can you make an economic case for land banks, right? Do they add value in the long term? Yes, there are plenty of, now see like this movement exploded in 2010, right? And that was when it also had access to funds through the national mortgage settlement, as well as hardest hit funds. So as we didn't have a body of research to even study, but I can tell you there are about 10 very compelling reports of economic impacts, drivers, uh, or excuse me, uh, other, other values, but reports that have been done to show how successful this was. The one that, that I showed with Houston, they showed some numbers about taxes return, but still the biggest problem is that we have, you know, it's like a, it's a, uh, disassociation of revenue and costs, 
right? The county gets the revenue from the taxes, they're done. The costs of vacant abandoned problem are incurred by the municipality. Police, the fire, the code, right? The neighbors, their equity. So, but if you look at some of the most successful land banks, you will find an incredibly uh, visionary and forward thinking treasurer or comptroller at the county that has been instrumental in advocating for land banks and for making this investment. So we run into some that are not visionary and no matter how hard we make the case or even present research, it's still challenging. But I will say that there, there are land banks and, and advocates that have spent three to five years educating and doing quantifying the impacts of the costs. And through that relationship building and hearing more and more stakeholders and hearing from the residents, they've been able to change people's opinions. In, in, tri, uh, in that uh, land bank in east, south, eastern Pennsylvania, they modeled the DTAC in Ohio, that Ohio, Ohio funding provision of 5%. They did that just by convincing everyone that the status quo is the most costly approach, right? And all of them voluntarily gave up 5% of their delinquent uh, fees and interest. So sometimes you just have to commit to that education, sometimes organizing, mobilizing, agitation. <clears throat> I don't know. Right. Change it. Also <laughs> point out, there is, it's a little bit different, the Cuyahoga Impact Report. Yeah. Um, there is a really compelling report that was commissioned by the Cuyahoga County Land Bank, which is Cleveland, different area necessarily, but, um, makes a very compelling economic case for how the land bank investments over the last 10 years have really transformed and had a massive economic impact uh, on the region. So I would, uh, certainly we can follow up with that information. You know, what we'll do is like, as we're working with Prosperity Indiana, right? Maybe we can provide some of those resources and those studies and we can get maybe a page on the website. And so just to build, so you, anyone will have that resource. Here are those studies that show the economic impact, okay? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, the Lancaster Bank is one of our closest communities. So I'm wondering, do you see yourself as a business that is also a big task for our community? You see that your company will establish an office in Fayetteville County, as I said, have a home here. Yeah. That is a, a great question. The question was, will community progress provide some support, ongoing support here? Uh, and the answer is, well, yes, absolutely, but in a different way than the way you described it. Because we're a national nonprofit. We're about 18, 19 staff members all over the country. 20, 23, okay. Uh, I've been in my hole in New York working remotely for too long. Uh, 23 staff, so I mean, we just serve the whole country from our space. We don't have offices even, I mean, and Flint is like our operating office in DC because of the policy work, that's it. But we joke, we, don't like breakups. We're not good with breakups. So like when we have an engagement, that's like I've known Jim for years, our partners up in city, uh, uh, Gary, like anyone needs to talk to us, we'll be here to help. But I, I'll tell you is we can't move the needle as much as we'd want. That's why when we do technical assistance engagements, we demand that we are, we also have community forums that we're introduced to folks on the ground because we want to be a resource to them, not just the decision makers who are in power now, right? So that's the best I got, but uh, we're always, we, we do have this program called the Community Revitalization Fellowship. And that was last couple of years, again, part of our evolution of how do we be more of a resource to residents. And we pick residents from different communities and then train them up for a year. Uh, and so that has been a great way to build kind of like coalitions and like peer networks. Um, but if you'd like, uh, get in touch with us afterwards and we can connect you with some folks. I think that if we have a woman here, we're going to have a lot of work to go on. So if you want to get back to me or me, because they're some, but we can have a local here that pushes it a little bit. 
Yes. Thank you for that question. And answered my question. Oh, okay. uh, have there been land banks involved in cleaning up soil contamination uh, by things like lead or mercury? The question was, have there been land banks involved in kind of brownfield remediation, right, and environmental contaminants? I. Suffolk County. Yeah, it's a, it was a, so thank you. He pointed out the one in New York. <laughs> Um, Suffolk County Land Bank in New York, uh, one of the two on Long Island, they were the only land bank in New York that focused exclusively on brownfields. But they didn't really do uh, brownfield remediation. And I know a lot of this is also questions in like residential areas. So they were looking at large industrial sites uh, and did some incredible work, but was able to bring in enough resources to do phase one assessments and then bring in pressures through the tax foreclosure and all of the owners came out of the woodwork. They collected millions of uncollected taxes or some of them just didn't and then they foreclosed and then they were able to do RFPs. Um, now that those contaminants were better known, right? That's always the biggest issue, the unknown. But in regards to like more residential areas, I haven't seen that. Um, but it's certainly like that is something where the land bank doesn't have to do it all. The land bank is that condo, is the steward of the land, and then is like, what needs to happen to the land based on the community priorities, and who are those partners that one would want to give ownership over to, but two that could help implement that, right? So. Yes. Yeah, I thank you for clarifying. I'm. St are we still like soil contaminant? Yeah. Yeah, and I know most of the land banks like that I speak with, they do all of that because they don't want to be involved in providing unhealthy housing. That's the whole goal. So they will spend the extra money and get all the lead and asbestos out. No, that sounds about right. I was just going to say that the, the whole concept of a land bank acting in terms of brownfield is sort of an untapped part of the field. Um, but an interesting part is that state legislation can provide some cover and governmental cover like it does in Michigan, for example. Mm -hmm. Land banks um, have some ability like a local government to own land to be protected from some of the uh, environmental issues and they can do it a little bit cheaper in certain cases so there's some opportunities there and i didn't want to yeah uh, that's a good that point it's a, but as yet uh it's, it's a scary thing when you're trying to focus on vacant and abandoned properties you got a lot of things you're worrying about to begin with. Yeah. um and so it, it can get a little complicated so. well, we have about 12 minutes left is there anyone here that wants to ask a question about it? Let me ask this gentleman first. I'm, I'm also going to be sticking around uh, with some of the snacks, so feel free to hang out. Yeah, would there be any advantage for a community like the city of South Bend, where you know you have a lot of residential areas where there's you know dilapidated homes, vacant lots, but we also have a lot of commercial corridors which are very yeah. similar. Are there any advantage to creating like two different land banks, one for a commercial district, one for residential? I, my gut instinct is no. My gut instinct is that one, the capacity of one land bank for most municipalities is, is a challenge. Uh, and like I've always seen that these are, these should become like centers of expertise in dealing with these problem properties. From air properties, right, to mortgage foreclosures, to commercial properties, to brownfields, that you build the expertise, the capacity in one center. Uh, and then it's also, I think, that that builds greater trust among the community, because I do know that there are a lot of agencies that have focused on economic development that maybe not have been, right, I, I would say is equitable or inclusive. Um, and 
I would say success begets success is that as land banks have started to build a portfolio of success, their access to resources just opens up considerably. We do think that there's going to, the, the outcome of the pandemic is going to be totally different from the mortgage foreclosure crisis and that there is going to be a much greater inventory of commercial properties that are underutilized. Part of that was already happening because of the everything moving online. But I think building that expertise in a land bank makes more sense. Some of my colleagues might even disagree with me, but as somebody who also practiced municipal, I like I, my gut is just build the expertise there. And some are doing that. Some are, I mean, some are dealing with old churches, right? That's a major problem in a lot of communities. So from churches to small commercial strips to residential, those that are at the front of the field, most of them in Ohio because of the funding, they already have a pretty uh, diverse portfolio. You touched on just a little bit. I didn't know if you wanted to talk any more about how can land banks best support existing homeowners who haven't been able to afford repairs because of this market in the future. How can land banks support homeowners that need repairs that might not have the resources to make repairs, right? in weak housing markets. Um, so that is something where we try, when we work, it's like, that's where there has to be interdepartmental collaboration, right? Land bank shouldn't be in a silo, that some of that work is code enforcement and change code enforcement from punitive to a resource, right? Like the code officers should be the one sharing information about programs and bringing that to folks not giving them tickets to appear in court. Um, so like one, I would say that is what we would talk with folks about, but land banks certainly have sometimes more access to resources just because foundations typically don't wanna give money to governments, but when they see land bank focused on vacancy and abandonment, there are many land banks that have a well-resourced foundation behind them providing maybe every couple years, right? Uh, so. Uh, they can certainly design some programs that could help that. In fact, Toledo, Lucas County did that. Remember I showed how they went and surveyed every, every home? So it was like they had a much better understanding as to what the blocks needed, right? And who needed what? And where could a $10,000 grant work? Where can we deal a, a small urban garden? Where can we demolish a property? Where can we bring code enforcement against a bank foreclosure, right? Like, they started to align their strategies based on that understanding. Um, but code just, <laughs> it drives us nuts. It's, it's stuck in a time warp. I, I also think they're the most maligned individuals at City Hall, and so I have a soft spot in my heart for them because everyone hates them. <laughs> the tenants, the <laughs> landlords, the neighbors, the council members. But I've also seen that when we've worked with them and opened up new outcomes, right? that they take much greater pride in their work. Um, but we do have to, just as we're re-examining law enforcement, we have to seriously re-examine code enforcement. If we wanted to start a land bank here, what should we do? <laughs> what? <laughs> if you want to start a land bank here, what should you do? Oh, man. Are, are we having a drink after this, Ann? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just, just for fun, just, I, I kind of know the answer. <laughs> What well, you have done uh, a lot of work, there's, there's a lot of work that has been done here in South Bend, right? There's been a very aggressive demolition campaign from years ago and built up a vacant property task force and an excellent report before the land bank legislation was passed, right, in 2016. There's now some great research and report and there's renewed interest in this idea of a land bank, particularly since we've seen three in uh, Indiana. I would say that you have to examine what is going to be the best structure and form because you create it via an, uh, a municipal ordinance or a county ordinance or an intergovernmental agreement with, or with, with uh, respective ordinances at those local levels. So there's many different ways you can go. I think you need to get everyone together and figure out where is their leadership buy-in truly examine what are the benefits and drawbacks of each um, 
and then, and then think about moving forward. Don't get hung up on the funding because there are 250 land banks in operation. There are 60 in Ohio. The rest of them are doing great without dedicated, reliable funding. Uh, it, it happens, it just, it comes up. And with the new federal investments that are coming down, like there's going to be money. It might not be there immediately when you want it, but there will be there. So do the work you can do now. And I would say, make sure, make sure, make sure you're talking to those uh, organizations, associations, leaders in the neighborhoods that have been dealing historically with this problem disproportionately for decades. Like make sure that they're at the table. Don't make that decision about what you do with just some white leaders in the room. Excuse my language. <laughs> Yeah, they're very different, <laughs> all three of them. That's also what we're, we're hoping to be here for. You know, we're, we're not gonna solve this next month. We're Community Progress is gonna be here as a resource. We wanna like continue to train up and build the capacity of prosperity in Indiana. Some of the regional associations are very interested in this. Like, how, again, how can we lift up the knowledge and understanding uh, so again, it's not imbalanced knowledge and power uh, and really explore different ways and let's be creative and trailblazers. Emulate what's working, but every community is unique. You've seen how flexible this tool is, right? What are your priorities? What do you want, right? Particularly in those neighborhoods that are experiencing that and then, and then go from there. Absolutely, I have my card over there, okay. and uh, the brochure of our organization. Our email service. Uh, I will make sure that this gets dis uh, posted on Prosperity in there, and we'll build at least one page for the scholarship program, and we'll start adding resources to that, uh, and just reach out anytime, seriously. And I'm also gonna be sticking around here for about half hour. We have I just want to thank those at home that stuck around uh, in your pajamas, no, with your kids, I get it. Uh, thank you for tuning in and also everyone here. I really appreciate your interest. Absolutely. Yes. have to do it. And thank you so much for coming.